You know, the election campaign, the victory of uh, the first African-American president in our nation's history was a major success, major breakthrough in my, in my, point, in my point of view. And it augured well for the future. I think it held, held, held open the possibility of you know, changing the balance of forces in this country in favor of uh, the, this popular movement, you know, in favor of peace and jobs and justice, immigrant rights. But there wasn't a movement to sustain that in the post-election period. I mean, there was activity going on. I mean, I just heard about all the activity going on here in, here in Tucson. There was activity going on in other cities and states around the country. But it wasn't at the level necessary in order to make a good president a great president. <clears throat> I steal that phrase from Jesse Jackson, who used it in Wisconsin uh, two weeks ago. FDR, for instance, was a popular movement during that time. And uh, that helped, you know, that was one of the, you know, maybe the main factor that helped to bring about the New Deal. You know, Roosevelt responded to it. He had a good sense to it. Lyndon Johnson responded to the popular movement around civil rights. He may not have wanted to, but he did. And it's to his credit that he did. I don't think the president today has the same sort of movement that, that can nudge him where necessary, join him when we're in agreement, and kind of move the whole process forward. So to me, what's happening in Wisconsin you know, suggest that maybe, maybe that, that, that the missing element is going to change. You know, that we have a new, new chance, new possibilities to build this broad popular movement, both now and going forward through 2012 and then into the post-election period. If we do that, and if there's the right kind of outcome in 2012, it could herald a new period in our country's history. You know, much like, I would say, the New Deal. You know, times are different, circumstances are different, the challenges we face are different. You know, for example, they didn't worry about global warming at that time. We must worry about global warming at this time. So there are new challenges that we face. But there, are the, there is the possibility that we can set in motion a progressive agenda coming out of the 2012 election. You know, roughly, uh, there has been some improvement in the official unemployment rate, but it's not substantial. And uh, even with that improvement, unemployment uh, is close to 9%. And there's little reason to think it's going to get too much better than that. I mean, on the one hand, the Republicans have made it impossible to legislate any job creation measures. And on the other hand, the corporate class has declared a strike action. You know, they have about $2 trillion in hand. They haven't done too badly in the course of this crisis. In fact, in many ways, especially the financial institutions, they've strengthened their political and economic position. You know, we usually think it doesn't, it's not supposed to work out like that. You know, there's an economic crisis, you know, the old the old imagery is that uh, we come out of it with a stronger hand, with being able to, you know, launch a progressive agenda, but that hasn't been the case. But anyway, the corporate class has declared a strike about a year ago, and they're investing nearly nothing with their $2 trillion. Or if they do invest it, they invest it abroad, or they invest in speculative ventures. So it's hard to think that the unemployment rate's going to come down too much. And uh, even with rate, the official rate as it is, we have about 25 million people who are either unemployed or underemployed. So that's about uh, three times the size of the city of New York. Um, I'm not sure how big Houston, uh, Houston, Tucson is. Well, I guess it would be a big multiple of that. 25 times. 25 times. So we have a lot of unemployed in this country who need work, are looking for work, uh, but can't find it. 
you know, every and it doesn't it doesn't strike people across the board. Uh, it's it's uneven in its impact, and I think we got to appreciate that. I just read a study of the Economic Policy Institute, and uh, the general drift of the of the of the study is that unemployment in the African American community is about twice as high as it is in the white community. And I'm sure if they did a study of the Latino community, they'd find you know similar differences. You know, then there's the educational crisis. Everybody's talking about that. I mean, there are different solutions to it. Um, in New York, all we talk about is charter schools. That's the way to solve the educational crisis. But, you know, to my mind, the educational system is still grossly underfunded. And I live in the Bronx, where at, in the, in the local high schools, which are made up mainly of black and Latino students, they're all overcrowded, all sometimes double the size that they should be. You can't learn in that sort of environment. Uh, but it's not being addressed. All the, all the whole conversation is about charter schools and privatization of a, a public education system. Then there's a housing crisis. And there are millions who've lost their homes already. And then there are millions of people who are living in what do they call that? Underwater. Under, their homes are underwater. In other words, uh, uh, the value of the home is worth less than the, the mortgage payments they make. Then, the, then there's, the, then there's the, the equality crisis I just mentioned about unemployment rates as the impact upon uh, African American Latino communities. You know, there's a lot of talk. Uh, it's not new talk, but it reached a new, new crescendo after the election of President Obama, saying that this is a, you know, post-civil rights period that we've entered. The problems of equality have been solved. <laughs> Racial equality, gender equality. It's a new era that we're entering. But obviously that's not the case. I mean, it doesn't take, you know, too close a look as to, to, as to what's happening on the ground to come to the conclusion that that's... Uh, you know, a, a complete falsehood. Then there's a hunger and food crisis. And uh, that has a special impact upon children in this country. Uh, there are millions of children going to bed hungry at night. Uh, millions of families who have problems of food security. I mean, it's hard to believe that in the wealthiest country in the world that, that we have have such problems, uh, but that's a reality. Then there's the poverty crisis. You know, uh, roughly 40 to 45 million people still live in poverty in this country. And that's not changing at all. In fact, it's growing, you know, under the impact of this economic crisis. Then there's the environmental crisis, which uh, is nearly everywhere. And uh, it has many different manifestations. Uh, perhaps the most uh, threatening one at this moment is global warming. Uh, everybody I talk to, everything I read suggests that uh, we're at uh, a point, nearly we're approaching a point of no return. Global warming is here, but we're approaching a point where the feedback effects from it could be catastrophic unless we take emergency action. Uh, James Hansen, who's one of the foremost authorities on global warming, he wrote a book not, not too long ago that he dedicated to his grandchildren. And I, I'm a, a grandfather for the first time myself. And uh, <coughs> And you begin to, you know, the, the, the problem of global warming resonates in a different kind of way. Uh, but it's something that's urgent that we're going to address immediately. We can't wait. But uh, there are obviously a major, major political and class interests that oppose any sort of uh, solution to this crisis. 
from the energy complex and many, many others. <coughs> the right wing who deny it, say it doesn't exist, and so on. Anyway, uh, U.S. capitalism is in crisis. I think it, it's, it's, it has dimensions that it had never had before. Now, on a world scale, because capitalism is a, is a, is a global system, uh, the crisis has an even more pronounced character to it. 2.5 billion people, nearly half the world's population, survives on less than $2 a day. $2. Over 850 million people are chronically undernourished, and three times that many frequently go to bed hungry. Every hour of every day, 180 children die of hunger, and 1,200 die of preventable diseases. Over half a million women die every year from complications of pregnancy and childbirth. 99% of them live in the global south. Over a billion people live in vast urban slums without sanitation, sufficient living space, and durable housing. And 1.3 billion have no safe water to drink. Three million die of water-related diseases every year. And to make matters worse, climate change will lock the world's poorest countries and their poorest citizens in a downward spiral. You know, according to a UN official, I quote here, climate change is a threat to humanity as a whole. But it is the poor, a constituency with no responsibility for the ecological debt we are running up who face the immediate and most severe human costs.